So what I want to talk about is a, a, a thing that a project that I would really love to start. This is just kind of my own passion project for many years. I've been kind of going around and talking about uh, the lack of um, hackability in our own assistive devices. And I'm thinking of my own wheelchair here as like my main example that affects me personally. But there's so many other examples. Um, and so um, I'm really thinking of this as a, a broad umbrella open source project and open, free and open licensing project, hopefully. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about that idea. The mission, as I see it, would be to make assistive technology for disabled people more open and free so more people can build and use it. Um, I want us to be able to document these projects, um, open license if possible, pirate if not, <laughs> tag our <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your laugh, Danny. <laughs> Tagging, you know, labeling, categorizing, coming up with the, making it really good and usable data. Um, archive it and share it. Make it very widely available. Assistive technology information so it's free for, for people to use. Um, and in this, I would include inventions, like if somebody were to invent a fabulous open source power chair <laughs> design or designs. Hacks, just everyday hacks that you use plans and designs to build things um, that are useful for disabled people or people with chronic illnesses, et cetera, parts lists, repair manuals, anything you can imagine like that. And to really make, uh, beyond just publishing these plans, make a healthy ecosystem that we can support these projects so that you can, you can take a, a project and translate. You can fork it. You can you know, report issues. People, so these things can evolve instead of just sitting in a static document. So what do I mean by assistive tech? Mobility devices, like I mentioned, wheelchairs, manual wheelchairs, power chairs, mobility scooters, things to help people with limited dexterity or limb differences. So, like you, you know, how do you, uh, you know, put your shirt on when you have one arm? There's all kinds of devices that help you do things like zippers and buttons. Um, AAC, assisted and augmented communication, things like voice banking, hearing aids, insulin pumps, any kind of like medical devices, kind of like um, we were talking about earlier, like. <laughs> like Molly was talking about, um, uh, the relationship that we have with our devices is super important here. And I, I love all that she was saying about the right to repair. So I, I was thinking too about masks and face shields, which you don't necessarily think of as a medical device. But if you think about the early phase of the pandemic when people didn't have enough uh, personal protective equipment in hospitals and ERs and even in, in in the ICU, and there was a huge drive amongst makers and hacker spaces everywhere um, around the world to manufacture PPE. We were all sewing masks, we were making face shields, we were just trying to come up with this stuff, um, and there weren't, you know, great plans out there to do it, and we had to evolve them and publish them and share them as rapidly as possible. It was a very interesting, interesting experience. Um, so why care now about this kind of tech? Uh, maybe you don't need it. Right, but when you do need it, <laughs> you're really gonna need it, and you're gonna be too busy, distracted, in pain, maybe in poverty. Right, if you're in terrible health, then then you know, you, that's not the time that you want to suddenly invent and hack your own things. Now, I'm not saying that we don't, because we totally do. But if you wait until you're say 85, you're gonna have a harder and harder time. So I really think it's important. Um, it's important to have empathy for other people and do stuff because it's 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 a good thing to do and it's fun and it uh, uh, makes information free, but also do it for your future self. Think about your future self and what you, will, you, you may need. So when I talk about ecosystems, I kind of think about bicycles. Like bicycles have been an invention for a long time. You don't need a bicycle, right? But if you have a bicycle, it gives you all of this power and independence. It's like this tremendous piece of technology that um, there's, there's all kinds of ecosystems to support it. Now we have e-bikes, and e-bikes are getting cheaper and cheaper, more affordable, and maybe more repairable. Um, and there's, there's, you can make a whole business model around um, selling, fixing bikes, inventing bikes. It's very uh, uh, fruitful. Uh, but there's no equivalent good ecosystem for wheelchairs, other assistive tech in a, uh, invention or maintenance. And I want to talk a little bit about why, because that's crucial to you know, fixing it. <laughs> the situation. So why isn't there more free and open source access hacking? Uh, people have the model in their minds that there, there's sort of, a, it's a thing that only medical experts should do, right? People may have a charity model 
in their heads where disabled people are sort of passive and you give them charity, like you buy a wheelchair and you give it to them and then you just kind of go away and hope that they, you know, that's fixed all their problems. Um, disabled people may be isolated from community, right? So people may not know what, what is needed. Or people may be working very hard to come up with solutions for themselves or for their loved ones or people they know, but then those solutions are not shared super widely. They might, you know, go on someone's blog at best, you know, and then disappear when the creator's health gets worse and they can't maintain that blog, or worse when they die. And this just happens over and over. Um, so I want to talk about some other things um, as this is kind of the setting the scene background. So. We see a lot of people try to do projects. You see like people doing hackathons, people doing design engineering projects or charity projects like I talked about. And here's some anti-patterns to really watch out for if you're involved in one of those things. Creating systems that disabled people can't contribute to themselves. You know, have your hackathon in a super inaccessible place, for example. <laughs> Naming any names. <laughs> <laughs> but what if you were having a hackathon for blind people and you held it somewhere super not accessible? It would be, it would be amazing. And we, I, I actually see this all the time. People are like, oh, we're going to bring in a disabled person and partner them with a group of engineers, and then they're going to invent something. But they don't think about the accessibility of the event itself or the thing they're making or the way that they're making it and the tools they're making it with, you know, whether that person can actually engage in a way that isn't just tokenizing them. So. Um, Information silos, you know, you invent a lot of stuff and then you chuck it in somewhere that you can only get to if you buy into it or that's going to disappear, if, you know, once AOL fails or something. One-off solutions, like I mentioned with the, you know, the, the idea of the hackathon, the blog, the student contest for engineering students, they love to make a disability invention that just disappears and you, it never sees the light of day again. Um, people... Um, I just want to think about, you know, whether you're exploiting a vulnerable population. You know, you don't want to actually just test your device on vulnerable people, even though you want to make stuff for them. Freaking out about liability, I had to put that in bold because that's a huge one. It's just amazing. Like, people are like, well, uh, what if I, you know, you make this wheelchair, I made these plans, and somebody makes the wheelchair, and then they trip and fall, or they fall out of it, and I get sued. And huge, you know, like different charities I've talked to uh, are very worried about this. Um, but nobody ever says this about a bicycle. They're not like, oh, what if we invented a bicycle and let people build a bicycle and fix a bicycle and then someone fell off it and died? I don't know. So the idea that the disabled person is like a helpless, you know, uh, uh, infantilized uh, recipient of charity really plays in here to this whole liability freakout. Um, I know there are laws that are meant to protect people. Sometimes they go so far that we that, that people suffer the opposite way, and they can't access the technology that would help them because people made it cost $30,000. Uh, anyway, uh, selling out to industry, people might invent something amazing and then think, well, I've got to patent it, and I've got to sell it to some corporation like, you know, Invacare or Permobile, and uh, then that thing also never, you know, never happens. And as I mentioned, one-off help from charities. I'm not knocking it. It really helps people. People often, it's their last resort, like, oh, no, my church is going to build me a ramp or something. But it's, it's not like systemically fixing the thing that I really want to fix. So here's some, uh, now that I've set that slightly depressing stage, here's an example, some examples of cool hacks and inventions that I would think of as good candidates for being documented and shared and improved on, you know, iterated on. Um, little physical hacks, not just software, not just hardware, um, but like stuff you make out of duct tape. These are my crutch tape pockets from years ago. <laughs> um, they're very individual. People invent them all the time. If you are just out on the street without staring at them, just you check out a wheelchair user and you'll just check out that they have, I always check them out because, no, no. I check, check out their chairs and their gear because they've always got some cool solution where they've attached stuff to their chair. They've got little bags they sewed into special places. They've got carabiners clipping things on all over the place. Um, no special skills or tools are needed. You've got some Velcro, some cable ties, um, and you've, you've made some attachment points, and you've actually done something amazing uh, to help you in your everyday life that, weirdly, wheelchair manufacturers don't think about, or when they do, they charge you like $1,000 for a thing to hold your cane up, and you could just use a piece of PVC. Anyway. Um, so here's, yeah, here's an example of that. PVC pipe. Uh, and some hose pipe clamps to make crutch holders uh, for the back of someone's bike. 
Um, it has kind of some lessons there. Like, A, you can make something incredibly cheaply that does cost, I looked it up, it costs like $300 and they never thought about putting on a bike. They just think about how to put your crutches on your, your scooter, your mobility scooter. Um, but also, yeah, not assuming that people won't put stuff on their bike. Um, physical hacks, um, I put a dexterity example here. It's a very simple um, but super powerful idea of having these spiral things. A lot of these kinds of inventions are in like mimeographed, spiral bound, you know, low run books from 1972. <laughs> you know, th th and those things, I'm worried about those books because they're disappearing from libraries. Libraries are throwing out this older stuff that maybe people aren't checking out. And um, people invented some really, really marvelous, um, easy to build stuff that we, we need to preserve. Um, uh, I have some complex hack examples here, like ramps. How do you build a wheelchair ramp? Um, there's uh, all kinds of nonprofits that have these plans and develop them, and then maybe put them online by accident, like I think Min the Minnesota uh, Center for Independent Living did once, and then I just pulled them all down. But <laughs> um, people, people put them up, and then they're like, oh no, someone might sue us, and so they take them down again. But if you really go looking, you can find this kind of thing. And um, this, this is exactly what should be out there um, and shareable for, for all kinds of people around the world to use. Uh, as plans. Um, here's another one that I just love to rag on because <laughs> there's a lot of inventions like this that are basically like a thing you attach to someone's wheelchair that makes an art project on the ground so that like disabled kids can like make a thing. And that's cool, but then instantly they make it proprietary. It's just amazing. So, I mean, why? Why not just show someone how to do this, publish some interesting plans? You could gather, you know, 100, 200 different ways to attach stuff to the front of a wheelchair and make art with it, and that would be that would be really cool. And you could still make a business on it too. You could make just like we know from our experiences in in open culture and open source, uh, free and open source software. We know that we can we can uh, publish these things, open license them, and then someone could make a business around it. They could take it and be like, I'm going to be the person who makes these things for schools, you know. That would be amazing. Uh, another, uh, more examples here, open source software and hardware for insulin pumps. There's all kinds of groups doing this. Pacemakers, um, all, any kind of machine that integrates with your body that is considered a medical device. People are trying to figure out how to hack it. My friend Ron um, uh, actually ended up having to hack the bed that he was in. He was in a special bed that like moved him every 15 minutes with like air currents to prevent pressure sores, and it, he got a new fancy one, and it literally threw him out of bed. <laughs> and so, he, I'm laughing, but it was terrible. But I'm laughing because he was laughing as well. Um, but he, he ended up, you know, hacking the firmware of that machine in order to reprogram it to, um, yeah, what a stud. Love you, Ron. Um, open source hearing aids, there's people doing all kinds of hacking for open source hearing aids, and now that they're becoming uh, you know, commodity devices that you can just buy over the counter, we're gonna hopefully see more of that and uh, more of those projects to adjust the software, say, in your hearing aid, or maybe to build your own. Um, biohacking, there's people doing open source insulin production, super exciting. Um, and then my favorite, open license power wheelchairs and mobility scooters. There's only a few of these projects. Um, there's a few out there, and they're very new. They're very recent, just in the last maybe five years. Um, they are popping up and they're trying to do projects where they integrate with the community and uh, um, build wheelchairs that will work in a specific terrain, in a specific location, um, under those conditions. So I would love for Disability Technology Foundation, my hypothetical nonprofit that I'm about to start, I would love to partner with these people to like pull them in, to gather up their stuff and help them expand and, and cover even more areas and, and get their, their plans out there more widely into the world. Um, so all these things are just examples of how I want to radicalize the world of physical inventions for by and for disabled people. Um, so all of these things, software, hardware, and just like gadgets you make out of duct tape, need more openness. Um, and I also think, I believe very deeply, free and open culture needs the physical inventiveness, uh, the adaptations that are driven by our necessity. Um, that, that free and open culture really needs disabled people's perspectives. You can, you can talk about the amazing inventions that people do, um, the, the drive uh, that we have to 
uh, to, to create things that actually work for us. Or you could think of us as like, you know, edge cases that powerfully break your, um, your stuff. You know, that's, that's also a fine model for inclusion. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot here, a lot here that, that can be done and plenty of work that can be done. I'm actually doing uh, work um, not as part of this new venture that I'm, I'm creating, um, but I'm also involved in grant making with an organization called Disability Inclusion Fund, um, and this is Disability Inclusion Fund in tech. So it's, it's for uh, trying to give large grants over three years to projects that, and people who um, are working at the intersection of technology and disability justice. So uh, people sometimes you know, don't know what disability justice means and that's kind of too much for me to go into right now. But it, if you read about it and think about it, it's different from fighting for rights. It's fighting for sort of more of a, a, a movement building around, around um, bringing justice uh, in an intersectional way to our lives. Um, anyway, <laughs> more just a little bit more about my nonprofit. <laughs> Disability Technology Foundation, in theory, is going to provide a pathway for open licensing for hacks and inventions for people to document and share. Um, over the next, say, year, I want to start scanning uh, paper plans and documents from people's archives, various people who are disabled or who are rehab uh, workers um, who have ac accumulated large masses of this information, get it online, get it scanned, uh, not just scanned, but really digitized to make it accessible for people with screen readers. Um, tagging and organizing it is going to be just really crucial. And doing direct outreach to inventors and organizations to invite them to contribute. So people like those open wheelchair, uh, open power chair projects that I was talking about. I want to reach out to lots of inventors and say, hey, you made this amazing thing, but you're, you don't have a license on it. Let's do that. And let's get it somewhere where it's going to live beyond the life of you or your organization. You know. Um, I also think that even from those projects that I think are doing amazing work, they're missing the piece that makes it a, a sort of the, the, the power of that public living ecosystem where people can report issues, people can fork the plans or the code and, and really create new things. We could translate these inventions and these plans and parts lists and manuals. We could translate them to other languages and make them widely available that way and really make it easier for disabled people around the world to partner with other builders, other people who are inventing the same kinds of things, or who may have the tools to build stuff that other people envision. And with places like bike shops or car repair shops, I really need, I need to find like a scooter, like a motorcycle repair shop to make some metal parts for my, uh, for, for my wheelchair right now, actually. So I'm, I'm gonna try to bring that into practice and see what happens. I've had good luck with auto, upholstery shops making me cushions. That's been pretty cool. Um, and they always seem to enjoy, you know, doing creative work. Um, and, but, but really, we could, we could make something. I could go to San Francisco Bike Kitchen, you know. We could go to other organizations of, of, of right to repair um, activists, um, car repair shops, hacker spaces, maker spaces are really ripe for this kind of work. So in the next year, I'll be looking for contributors to this uh, project to do outreach, to participate in hackathons, um, maybe help scan, transcribe, um, and tag and organize this information, and maybe translate into more languages. And I'm also looking for partnerships with community organizations. If you have ideas, please talk to me um, anytime. And I'm going to be looking for funding, so talk to me if you think this is a cool idea and you want to help uh, fund it to bring it into reality. Thanks. Great. Does anybody have questions? Oh, I'll keep the mic then. Questions, yes. questions. So uh, my dad uh, is a retired occupational therapist. Uh -huh. And um, my whole life he's been like, because he worked for the public school department, he was kind of always hacking together odd pieces of equipment because the leak, like the catalogs are super, super expensive because they're covered by insurance. Et Very cetera, et cetera. expensive, yeah. Um, so I was thinking, because you were talking about partnerships with community orgs, 
there may be trade or like or professional organizations for retired <laughs> occupational therapists. And there are very much retired occupational therapists. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly who because they're not like, oh no, you're going to destroy my way of making a living. <laughs> yeah, no. right. But like, it doesn't. It doesn't destroy it. It means that it gives yeah. them tools, more tools at their disposal. So I think yeah. you're right. I think there's a lot of radical occupational therapists out there. Yeah, totally, totally. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because it's an interesting connection. But this is all really cool. So thanks for. I bet your dad is an amazing inventor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a few interesting ones. All right, any other questions? Okay, thank Oh. I, I'm on, everybody's observed that the internet has created these niche community support. I have a friend who has two different sized feet, and so she found somebody who has the opposite sized feet <laughs> from her, and they're like shoe buying buddies. You know, that, Amazing. Yeah, but that won't work for motorized wheelchairs because it has to be local, right? I mean, yeah. internet support seems like you might find a way to leverage, but there's no standard design, and the support has to be local because it's this heavy thing that's expensive. That's true. That's true. You really need to embed in a community because also I'm not going to, when I'm not feeling you know, mobile and then my wheelchair breaks, how am I going to get it somewhere? So, you know, yes, the people I bought my chair from come and fix it if I'm lucky. But actually, a lot of people, that's not necessarily true. If you've got like a complex chair that, say, tilts or has position positioning or, uh, you know, uh, the, the expensive, you know, things that break. This is why everyone's scared to fly because the airlines break your, your power chair and you're just absolutely screwed because there's only like two real um, uh Fixing, there's like Invacare and Permobile, I guess. And, you know, if they, they, if you ship your chair to them, you're just in bed for three months. What are you going to do? Do you have a backup chair? Maybe if you're lucky, if you're well connected into the com local community, uh, then, then maybe you get a backup chair. But if you're not well connected, then you're in bed getting pressure sores. So good luck. You and know? plus, shipping it's it. It could get damaged either shipping it. That is true too. It yeah, too. it's deeply disturbing. Oh, I, I have to mention one of my pet peeves. This is I'm taking out of Danny's talk, but my pet peeve is like Burning Man people who buy up used wheelchairs and then make them into like cupcakes or whatever that, that people drive around. It's really cute, but maybe they should like work harder to make their own things that aren't using up wheelchairs and taking them out of the market for disabled people that need a used wheelchair. Anyway. Yeah, so I think I they should do reparations. Comment. So whenever I, I see yeah. those people, I'm like, you need to do reparations and you need to like fix somebody's wheelchair right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and we really do need an open source community hacker-based um, organization, club, whatever, that can help people fix their wheelchairs, give them replacement wheelchairs when they're getting them fixed. Um, I've had a number of friends, uh, they're just, tra like literally they'll leave me a message Oh yeah, well, you know, I'll have to meet you in a month because I'm getting my wheelchair fixed, so I'm trapped in my house for three weeks. You know, like they're just used <laughs> this to is it, a very right? familiar story. And, and I'm yeah. like, oh my god, you know, I, I I can't believe it. And the fact that this is just a thing that you have to live with if you're a disabled person in a wheelchair doesn't make any sense to me. So no. maybe, maybe we can no. figure out a way to uh, to work together to come up with some kind of solution for this. Start in San Francisco, maybe make a pilot project and see if we can get it to catch on, see what we can do. All right. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Liz. <laughs>